I'm delighted to welcome Raina Wynn joining us at the Stanford Travel Writers Festival now in conversation with Julia Wheeler. Hello and welcome to the Stanford Travel Writers Festival and to this session in particular. Thank you for seeking us out. Thank you for coming on um, a rather different socially distanced walk today with the wonderful Raynor Wynne who joins us from Cornwall. Raynor, welcome to Stanford. Hi Julia, lovely to be here. I wonder, um, I'm thinking about people coming to watch this, some of whom will have read and delighted in The Salt Path and some who will be coming to it fresh. So I wonder whether you might, first of all, begin by telling us the story so far, really. We need a kind of previously on The Salt Path. Well, um, The Salt Path, if, if I'm going to describe The Salt Path, probably need to go back to the very beginning, the very, very beginning. Um, just before the salt path starts, actually, um, I'd met my husband, Moth, when I was 18, I was still a teenager, and I met him in a really crowded room at college. And I looked up through this great parting of heads, and there was this young man on the opposite side of the room with this bright white shirt on, dipping a Mars bar in a cup of tea. And just in that, that moment, I thought, you know, he's the one for me. And it turned out to be so because we spent the rest of our lives together, really. Um, but from that point onwards, we had this dream that we would find a, a house in the hills, a place that needed some work, that needed repair, that, that we could put our time and our life and our effort into. And we found that. And we, it had holes in the walls and a roof falling in. And um, we, we spent the next 20 years of our lives repairing it converting the outbuildings into holiday accommodation that became our main source of income and uh, living living this dream that we'd created for ourselves. But then, unfortunately, in the background, we had this financial dispute with a friend that ended in a court case and saw us being served with an eviction notice from that dream home. Um, so they gave us a week to leave our house, a week to pack 20 years of life into boxes and it was during that awful week that um, my husband Moth he, he was diagnosed with a neurodegenerative disease um, corticobasal degeneration it's an illness that's got no treatment and no cure and and then our life was was completely transformed not only had what we thought was the worst thing that could possibly happen to us in losing the house but only that happened but then our possible future together had been completely changed or taken away and we were lost completely lost there was no accommodation available to us nowhere to go um and really no no drive to take us into the next day so it was in the last the very last few moments when we were about to leave the house they lifts were knocking at the door and um, and I just spotted this packing case that hadn't been taken out of the door. And in that was a, a book that I'd read decades before uh, about a young man that walked the southwest coast path with his dog. And just in that awful moment, it seemed like the most obvious thing to do, just to fill a rucksack and go for a walk. And so that's what we did. We walked the 630 miles of the southwest coast path. And we, we slept wild, we lived wild on the headlands. We, we had hardly any money, hardly any food, but it became, it became a life transforming experience. It, it changed our way of living, our way of thinking, our way of looking at the world. And that, that became the salt path and, uh, and the book that maybe a few people have read. <laughs> Even if people have read it, I know that they will delight in hearing you explain it in that way. And if they haven't, then that's a, a wonderful taste. Of this. So thank you. Um, it, you say that it changed you. And in many ways, it strikes me that that is the archetypal hero's journey, really, isn't it? Being right down, transforming and coming out the, the other side, different people. So let's pick up with when you had finished that walk, where you found yourselves then, and actually where the place, it was the place where you sat down to write The Salt Path. Yes, 
Yeah, well, almost at the end of that walk, literally not two days to the end of where our walk was going to end, we met this lady in a cafe. And just um, over a cup of tea, we, we told her our story of what we were doing. And she um, said, actually, I've got, I've got a flat that's available right now in the village where we were going to end that walk. It seemed, it seemed absolutely too good to be true. So we took up her offer and, um, and that's where we went to live at the end of the Salt Path. And Moth was about to begin a degree because we decided that that would be a way forwards for us, a, a way to try to restructure our lives. So he was about to start a degree and um, and I was looking for work, basically, looking for work, which having spent most of my life working for myself and I was 50, um, it didn't go too well. Nobody seemed to want me, funnily enough. <laughs> um, so I was spending a lot of time in that flat. And it was in an actually a, a, a perfect, Cornish village, um, a beautiful place, um, but I, I couldn't settle. I couldn't, I couldn't seem to to settle. I couldn't sleep. I found myself really agitated most of the time, um, and it should have been it should have been perfect, and I couldn't work out why. I was back under a roof. We were, we were, starting to find a way back into life after all that time of being homeless. But it didn't make any sense to me why I, I couldn't relax into it at all. I found myself going out onto the headlands and back onto the coast path, which ran past the front door, basically. And I'd go back out into the headlands, even going up there at night and and finding myself out there on the cliff tops at night. And it, it became so ridiculous that eventually we put the tent up in the bedroom and... Uh, and I slept in that for weeks, but there was there was something about getting that tent back out of the back out of the um, bag and putting it up in the bedroom. And as I opened it, it was it was almost as if I could smell the salt air and feel the wind. And and I unrolled my sleeping bag, and it was full of full of sand from the walk. And um, and I think then in that moment when I got back in the tent, I started to realise really. What the problem was and and where where my problems were coming from and how much of working that out came from the writing that you did for the salt path i mean we should say that when you wrote that book that there wasn't as you said in any um sense of publication you wrote it very much um from a point of love really didn't you for moth Yes, yeah. Um, Moth was working on his degree and, and that meant that he had to be quite, quite sedentary. You know, it spent, you spend a lot of time in, in, in front of a screen, really, don't you? And um, that was having a really detrimental effect on his health. He was, he was starting to slow quite a lot and um, he, he was starting to lose his memory of really strange little points that were starting to slip from him which doesn't really make any sense when he was studying for a degree because it was as if he was taking in information here but leaking it out here really quickly it was very strange but at, at the same time he was he was starting to forget things about our walk and that walk it was so precious to me it felt like something really important that had happened to us and I couldn't bear the thought of him losing the memory of that forgetting that so I thought well, there's got to be a way I can capture it for him capture it and hold that walk for him um so I got the guidebook back out the, the little brown plastic guidebook that we'd used of Paddy Dillon's uh, and I opened it, and there were all Paddy's incredible descriptions of the path. And um, and then there's an OS map that runs right through it of the whole of the path. But in the margins, in the margins of the book, were the little penciled notes that Moth had made every night as we'd sat in the tent. Just little notes about where we'd slept or, or where we'd camped, the people we'd met. And... And I, I, I started to write those notes up in the hope that he would read them and he would he would start to remember things from the path. But as I, as I wrote them, they didn't they didn't 
feel like the path. They didn't feel like that walk. And that's when that's when those notes just became a narrative, because what I wanted to do was to make him feel when he read it as if he was right there, right there on the path next to me, so that he could he could smell the dust of the ground and he could feel the dryness of the air or the rain on his face. And that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to give him back the path. Um, and so I finished I finished writing it without him even knowing what I was doing because he was out at uni all the time. And uh, I printed it off on the printer at home and uh, it started out black and ended up pink as it ran out of ink. And I gave it to him for his birthday. And that's that at that point, that's what the salt path was. It was it was just for him. And it, it didn't have the name, the, the salt path, and it was called Lightly Salted Blackberries, wasn't it? So, and it was your daughter, I believe, who suggested that publication might be an option. That did happen and as they say the rest is history um, with the salt path because it became such a, a huge hit was revered and, and loved I wonder then with that behind you or possibly sitting on your shoulders how it felt to sit down again to write the wild silence and whether that was a different experience with the expectation but also just the, the style of the book being much more memoir rather than journey if you like yeah yeah it was a completely different experience writing wild silence because the salt path had been you know it'd been nothing no pressure just me writing um but the wild silence by the by the time i started to write it the salt path had already sold quite quite a few copies and so there was already that question of what's next can can i even write anything else can i write because the salt path you know it had been the first thing i'd written so so there was that sense of can I do it again? I don't know. Um, and I started to write it, and it really did feel like just a what came next. And I really didn't want to write that. It felt like it wasn't saying what I wanted to say, so I just left it. And I couldn't, I couldn't do it. And I thought, no, really, maybe I can't write anything else. Maybe, maybe I just can't do it. And um, I, I left it for a few months actually, and then I went back to it in. Uh, the April, I think it was, when it was supposed to be being handed in in the September of 2019. Um, and I still had only got a sentence and it was, okay, panic now. And I, I but then I started to realise that what I was trying to write about wasn't just a what comes next. It was about what we'd found in the salt path and where that came from, how how I've come to really understand that that deep connection to nature that both I and Moth really had, how that had taken us through that really difficult time, and and I needed to explore that. I think I needed to explore where that had come from, and how that was taking us forwards into our future. And then when I realised that, then I knew that I'd got to completely change the framework to from how I'd written the salt path to something something completely different so I was thinking well the salt path was just a, a, a linear journey where I was just going forwards along the path the wild silence was more of an emotional journey and in explaining that I needed to go back into my childhood as well as forwards into the future. So then it became sort of like a backwards and forwards through through my childhood, through through those early days of my relationship with Moth, and then on into where the salt path was taking us into the future. And by going back through your childhood and also the circumstances uh, with your mum, at the time of writing you you do take us into that relationship with with your mother um and you write so movingly ray um about her death and i think um that that's a um an experience that many people watching will have had i, I think you you capture um some bittersweet moments actually in a in a beautiful way um tell us about um the difficulty, I suppose, in helping your mother as much as you could, but also thinking about one person's death, but in the back of your mind having what you call the weight of another person's um, illness 
and, and having to think about the same decisions that you anticipate at some point you may have to make about moth. Yeah, that was the difficulty really. Um, not only was I losing my mum, um, but she 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 went into hospital with pneumonia and she had quite a, well, a very severe stroke and um, and that's why she was dying, was really the stroke, but then the pneumonia at the same time. Um, but moth, moth had been diagnosed with this illness that that we'd been told would probably end with pneumonia. That, that, that would be the final point. And so I was witnessing the death of my mother under the shadow of that being a predicted end for moth. And the two were somehow enmeshing themselves in my head in a way that I, I was finding really difficult to cope with. But at that time, being back there with my mum had taken me back to the back to the place where I'd grown up, back to the the landscape that I knew so well, back to the to the farmland and the, and the village and the, the woods that I'd grown up in, and and so I was spending all the time where I wasn't in the hospital, where I'd actually moved in and was living there. All that time when I wasn't in the hospital, I was going back to that place of my childhood, and in doing that, I be. I, I think I found where the root of that connection to the natural environment, that real sense of being part of nature came from and um, and how how my relationship with my mum, my relationship with life, death and the salt path and everything really had its roots in that childhood. And um, so when I started to write Wild Silence, and I realised what I was really writing about. I knew I'd got to go back to that point in order to take that theme forwards. Yeah, so it wasn't easy writing part one, that's for sure, but necessary, I think. Yeah. Um, you say that actually your parents understood that you needed the security of land, but it was only later that, that you realised that really that is really important to you. Yes, I think. I think they knew that as a child, I was I was quite a quite a what's the word insular sort of child. Uh, uh, I spent a lot of time on my own. I was quite happy in my own company. I, I would spend hours, days, summer holidays just in the woods, watching watching the animals, watching the rabbits in the fields, stalking pheasants or or spying on the gamekeeper and that was my childhood really and I think they knew although I think maybe they didn't have the words to put that into into some sort of tangible form but they knew that I needed a connection to the land because it was part of who I was more than I understood certainly in a way maybe I didn't understand at all at the time so when I met Moth and he uh, he came, he'd grown up on the edge of a town, um, but really in his heart he'd always been out in the wilderness. He was drawn to the mountains and the wild places. But as far as my mum and dad were concerned, he wasn't a farmer. He didn't have any acres, and so he didn't bring that security of of a life a life on the land. Um, so he just you know he wasn't the one in their eyes. <laughs> But you had plenty of really wild adventures, didn't you, when you were young? And you write in the book about an occasion when you realised really that, well, one, that you would follow Moth anyway, but which might have been an earlier realisation. But then there's a, a, um, a, a um, scenario that you write about um, where you realised that you'd always be safe with him, that you could trust him. Yes, yeah. Well, we had a few, a few very wild adventures when we were in our first years together. You know, we, he he was really, as I said, really drawn to the mountains and uh, rock climbing and um, and just basically just being in the hills. He's just really drawn to that wildness. And you know, I was I was obsessed. I would have gone anywhere with him. I would have followed him anywhere. Um and our very very first holiday we ever took together, um, we snuck away because my mum thought I was going somewhere else. Um and we I borrowed a rucksack from his friend and we went on a backpacking trip to Scotland. 
and uh, we were we were heading into into this real wild point in the northwest of Scotland, and uh, and we we left the road and, and we walked up through the through the hills and through these dried dried gorse and peat bogs. We we walked for hours, but it was a really still still hot summer's afternoon. Um, and, and it was just like a heat haze over the heather. Perfect. And we got to the foot of this mountain that seemed to come up like a huge tsunami of, of rock out of the earth. And it was really intimidating. And camped by this little rock at the base of this mountain. And, uh, and we had these tiny little, well, he said it was two man tent, but it felt like a one man tent to me. It was absolute tiny tent that we pitched there in this complete wilderness, two miles away from a road, absolutely nothing but us and the midges. And um, just as we were about to get into the tent that evening, we could hear this noise in the hills, like a sound, it sounded like singing. But then it got closer and closer and it was a herd of deer calling to each other as they were running down the mountainside and away from the hill. And it just seemed like something so magical, like the mountain was talking to us. But maybe, I've, I've learned since, that if deer are running down the hill, you should probably follow them. Because at two in the morning, we started to hear this noise that sounded like a steam train in the distance. But then it got louder and louder and louder until it, it really hit the tent like a steam train. Absolutely wiped the tent into this ball of nylon that we were trapped inside. Moth had got both his size 12 feet up on a one tent pole, trying to hold it up, but then it snapped and the whole thing just enveloped us in this wet nylon. And um, we got out anyway, we got into his survival bag. And if you've ever seen a survival bag, actually, it's just like a man sized plastic bag. And um, we, we got into this plastic bag that was full of holes by the time we'd scrambled into it just as the tent took off and it just spiralled away over the mountain. So we, we lay on this hillside in a plastic bag as it, as it slowly filled up with water, just peeking through this little crack in the plastic at this wild storm. And I've never seen anything like it. It was, a, it was a storm where the water seemed to be coming up, coming down, turning into balls of water in the air. It was, it was incredible, and lightning and thunder and... Um, the most incredible storm I've ever seen in my life. And when we woke up in the morning, those dried peat bogs were just absolute running water. There were, there were lakes, there were rivers, there were streams, there was just running water everywhere. And we had to get off that mountain, utterly exhausted after a night in a plastic bag. But I followed Moth down that hillside and even to the point where we came down to the road and he said, the only way now is to put your rucksack on this waterfall and basically ride it down to the bottom or we're not going to get there. Well, I was so, I was so, I would have followed him anywhere. And so I followed him down the waterfall. And, but by the time we got to the road and we were stamping the water out of ourselves and pouring water out of our clothes and our packs and just on the verge of hypothermia, I just knew then that something had happened in that night that, actually you know we hadn't just cemented a bond between ourselves it was a it was a bond between us and, and the natural world and our place within it and it was something that we that stayed with us I think for for most of our lives that sense of being not alongside but part of the natural world and um and yeah I still follow him wherever he goes thankfully no more waterfalls did you ever tell your mum that story? Did you ever own up that that's where you'd been? No, never. Not to the very end. <laughs> she never knew. <laughs> Lovely. We all have to have secrets like that. It's part of life. Um, now, the salt path obviously brought you um, a certain amount of notoriety, fame, um, accolades and so on. So that meant that I imagine that, you know, you weren't able to be quite as private as you were before and as you would have liked to have been. Lots of people wrote you letters, didn't they, about their own experiences and, and the, their responses to the sort path? 
Yes, yeah, they did. And it, it was really hard to start with when the Salt Path was first published because I hadn't I hadn't realised that um that actually I would have to take I would have to do PR because I would have to do events like this and actually talk to people. And I even then I, I, I was still a very sort of private person. I didn't I didn't talk to people. I was I, I was I was quite shy withdrawn sort of person really um and so to find myself on the stage talking about my book was was really difficult um but then i started to receive all these letters from people letters from people who'd read the salt path and wanted to explain how how they connected with that story and how how their lives have been changed by incidents through times when their lives had fallen apart through financial or emotional or or whatever route to go live, health reasons mainly, their, their lives had, had really gone on a route that they hadn't planned for. And how so many people had found their way back to, to, to their own life, their way back to themselves through time spent in nature. And I think I came to realise then, and not only with those letters, but with all the people that I met in the signing queues after the events, the people who told me their stories, I started to realise that actually I think we're all the same. We all share the same frailties and the same emotions. And and there's a huge connection in that. I think when you start to realise how, how much we are alike, then, then it can overcome so many barriers between between yourself and other people and um and it, it certainly did help me through those difficult early days of the pr for the salt path that's for sure it really did you were also doing some other writing and you wrote a particular article for um the big issue because the salt path is also about homelessness which i know is something that you feel very strongly about as well tell us about um meeting someone who had read that article and the effect that it had on them um yeah i wrote um, an article for the big issue before um before the salt path was published um i'd, I'd offered them an article um and they they taken it up straight away and it was an article about homelessness and about rural homelessness in particular and that had been published and then about a month afterwards i was walking on the coast path and I saw someone coming towards me, um, a backpacker, and we met at a gate. So I held the gate open for him. And this time it was my turn to be saying, you know, how where are you walking to? How far are you going? And um, he said that he'd started walking a couple of weeks before um, and he'd started in Penzance and he was heading east. And, uh, you know, I was saying, yeah, well, have you always walked? You know, what's what made you want to come do this? And he said, well, just a couple of weeks ago I was living rough on the uh, streets of Exeter but then I read an article in the Big Issue magazine about a couple who'd been homeless and they walked the coast path and I thought if they can do it so can I and he borrowed all the equipment he needed from a, a charity and they'd given him the money to get the train down to Penzance and he was walking and I said well come back with me come and have a cup of tea come have something to eat and he said no I can't because this path has already changed my life. It's changed everything. I need to keep walking tonight because I have a routine. I'll put my tent up and then I'll make my soup. He said, and I can't go back to how I was living before because this has changed everything already. It's changed everything. And I watched him walk away. And as he was walking away, you know, I could have been watching myself. It could have been, it could have been us, you know, a short time before. And it, it was something, it was something that moved me so much, just the thought that that path was really changing lives, that time just spent out in nature, walking, being utterly self-reliant on, on where you sleep, how you eat. There's something so strengthening about that, that it changed our lives and it, it was changing his life. And that was the point at which I thought, OK, I'm going to try and get the Salt Path published because if it helped us, then who knows? It might it might be helpful to somebody else. 
and walking back down off the coast path that day was the day I started to Google around and look for an agent, um, which I found, weirdly enough, that afternoon. <laughs> and it, it went from there. We've talked about you looking back, um, but many people's reason um, for for reading The Wild Silence will be to find out also what happens uh, next. So let's move on, on to that side of things. Um, talk to us about Twitter, Ray, and, and the good and the, well, actually, mostly the good that has come out of Twitter for you, but your um, perhaps reticence to start with. Well, yes, it was just like the PR. When the publishers said, actually, you know, we need you to take play, take part in PR and um, and we need you to do social media. I was like, what? what? I had no idea. No idea what social media was all about. I'd never touched it in my life and had never intended to. Um, but anyway, they encouraged me to sign up to Twitter to help pu publicise the book. And uh, I did. And I had no idea what I was doing at all. So when someone said, oh, um, I'd like to have a chat, can I have your phone number? I just gave them it. Yeah, I gave them my phone number. But actually it probably turned out to be one of the better things I, I'd done. Because um, I had a phone call from, from this man who said he'd read The Salt Path and he connected with it on such a personal level that he felt he had to get in touch. And that he had a... Uh, historic but very run down, neglected cider farm, just a few miles away from where we were living. And that he had a dream that, although he couldn't live there himself, that actually that place, we could find a way to restore the biodiversity and bring the wildlife back and, and allow it to, to be what it should be environmentally. And he'd read The Salt Path and thought, we were the ones to help him do that. And would we go to the farm and help him achieve his dream? Well, what do you do? What 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 do you say when somebody's offering you a life that you don't imagine you're ever going to find your way back to? A life of you know spending every day out on in in the environment on the land. Um, and also with the way Moth's health had deteriorated while he'd been so stationary and so indoors. We sort of knew that for his health to ever be any better than it was, we had to find a way to be outside, to be active all the time, because that's what had helped him so much when we were on the coast path. So we spent months of procrastinating, months of not knowing what to do because there was that sense of could we possibly trust anybody again you know we trusted our friend and look where that got us you know homeless <laughs> and, and then when we were on the path we'd been met with so many so many difficult you know responses when people had found out we were homeless but we'd really lost our ability to trust people that ability to just believe in people that they might actually mean what they say um but then one evening we came here just to have a, another look around the house. And um, it, it, the house had been neglected for quite a long time. It was incredibly damp and it was full of mould and it, it smelt really bad. But as we were about to leave, there was this noise in a hedgerow next to us and a deer jumped out of the hedgerow, walked in front of the house and it then just disappeared into the long grass and the weeds that were everywhere. And just in that moment, there was something so magical about that. We thought we've just got to do this. We've got to take the chance. And uh, so we just held hands and jumped. And here we are. <laughs> Fantastic. I wonder whether you would be kind enough, Ray, to, to read for us um, from that moment, really, when you you take that plunge, as it were, or when you when you see the landscape that you have now moved into. Yeah, I can do. It's from when we, uh, from when we first visited the land with, uh, with Sam and uh, what we thought when we got here. <clears throat> we stood on the brow of a hill on a patch of land that had been burnt rock hard in a summer hotter than anyone could remember. The land fell away to the river where boats drifted on the high tide and the light reflected in a white ribbon through the trees on its banks. But up on the hillside there was no water no green, the scorched earth spread along a broad ridge, 
grass grazed to soil height by cattle and sheep in every field. As the grass had dried up, the confined animals had been driven to eat the hedges and scratch away at the soil beneath in an attempt to find shelter from the burning sun. What could have been lush green hedges, thick barriers between fields and highways for wildlife, were now no more than stark woody stems with sparse patches of shriveled leaves, the roots exposed to the drying air, the earth in submission. I started feeding silage, winter fodder crops in midsummer. But it's not just here. Farmers can just about hold these high stock levels in a normal damp summer. But when there's just a slight shift in temperature, this is what you get. It's like this right across the south this year, overstocking, and fields can't take it. But I'm heartbroken to see it here. Sam gestured animatedly across the fields with his hand. A man whose hands appeared never to have seen dirt or caught the fleece of a ewe thick with lanolin or laid a hedge. The clean, soft hands of an office worker. It's not as if I don't understand the land. My parents are farmers. I grew up on a farm across the border in Devon, but we don't farm like this. This is just the use of the land for profit with no concern for its future. I work in the city, always have. So profit and loss is my business. But if you sell out your capital and you've got nothing left to build on, and environmentally, that's what's happening here. I can't just sit by and watch it anymore. He pushed his hand through his hair and adjusted his designer sunglasses. Bless Sam. Um, wonderful. I'm sure he's he's as delighted as you are with you, you being there and what you've managed to achieve. I wonder whether you would... Um, perhaps draw the distinction between what you found and when you were looking at in that passage and actually what you've managed to create there now? Well, when we first came, the land was really heavily, heavily stocked. And in order to, to maintain those sort of stock levels, you've got to put lots of, lots of fertiliser input into the land, uh, as well as, you know, weed killers and everything else that goes with that in ordinary everyday farming, as we see at the moment. But also the land was covered in every type of, of agricultural waste and detritus, you can imagine. And there was hardly any wildlife here. We first came, there were a few sparrows squabbling in the hedgerows and a couple of crows that nested in the hedge and the trees just down the road. But um, that was it, really. That, that was all we saw, other than the one deer that one night. But just two years later, two years of... of Really, not what we've put onto the land, but what we've what we've taken away. We've take, taken away all of that plastic waste, all of the, the detritus that was poisoning the land. We've reduced all the inputs right down and reduced the grazing on the land. And already, just in those two years, we've started to see such a shift in the biodiversity and in the wildlife. There's been there's been wildflowers and plants here that certainly weren't here before and with that has come all sorts of of, um, of insect life and clouds of butterflies last summer and things that certainly weren't here before and with all the insect life the bird life has moved back in and there have been rather than just the sparrows we've had so many birds here there have been yellow hammers and pied wagtails and, and every type of bird that you can imagine really and woodpeckers that have nested in the tree next to the house and had all their young on the wall in front of the house um, and then recently the barn owl has moved into the barn and I think when you when the raptors move in then you know that the whole food, food chain is there and you're getting it right because because if there's something to eat there's something to eat all the way down the, down the food chain and just in those two years, it's as if as if the land is starting to breathe again, as if it's starting to find its natural rhythm again. I think in a way, in a way, it's very similar to Moth's health and how it improved when we were walking on that coast path, where when he was back in a more natural state, where he was walking every day and he was he was living on that really restricted diet and out in the wild environment, his health really improved. And I think there's a similar thing happening on the land, where where it's you allow it to get back into a more natural rhythm, 
and it, it's finding a way to heal itself. I see that as a bit of a parallel, really. And um, hopefully we can keep it moving in, in that direction. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we we wish wish him very well and, and you very well on the land, the land very well, I guess. You you talk um, in the section, which is a lovely section, when you go off to Iceland, which we'll perhaps talk about in a second, um, again, walking. You talk about us getting to a certain stage where we stop trusting our bodies. You know, when we're young, when you were coming down that waterfall in Scotland, you know, you were trusting moth, you were trusting your body to be able to cope. But you ask about you know, when is that moment when that stops? And, you know, should it or actually must we keep on trusting our bodies as much as we can? Yeah, it was a strange thing in Iceland. Um, um, as with happened a few times on the salt path, there was that sense of people thinking we were too old to be doing what we were doing. And in Iceland, when we were walking on what turned out to be actually quite a difficult um trek across the southern highlands of Iceland um, there were a lot of young people well a lot quite a few because it's the very tail end of the season of young people also making that trek and a really strong sense of what are you doing here it's irresponsible being here at your age and and it's a fact it's a fact you really don't feel quite the same backpacking when you're in your 50s as you do when you're in your 20s but I think the most noticeable thing is when you're going downhill and there's that real sense of the need to protect your joints. And um, and it's it is it is as if you stop trusting your body to just respond in a way when you're young, you don't think about it. You don't think about what will happen when I put my feet to the ground. Will my knees take the take the shock? And you stop trusting your body. Um, and I really thought at that moment. I've got to put my my 20 year old head on and treat it in that way. And somehow when you stop tensing yourself against against the, the compaction of your foot hitting the earth, then it's a strange thing that happens to your body. It starts to move, move in a way it used to. And, and it made me start to think that actually a lot of aging is about not trusting yourself. It's about you stop trusting your body to be as capable as it was. And I think you stop trusting yourself to be as able to change or, or to do something new or to just embrace life with the same enthusiasm. And I think uh, we prematurely age ourselves in, in a lot of ways because, because we do that. I heard Graham Norton speaking about this actually a couple of weeks ago on the radio and um, he was saying, I think it was that his sister said, in order to keep doing things, you have to think, well, I could do it yesterday, which means I can do it today and then I'll do it again tomorrow. And I think that's actually quite a, a quite a good way of looking at it. You know, if you could do it yesterday, you can you can crack on with doing it today. Um, anybody who's read The Salt Path will be delighted to know that Dave and Julie, who you met on the Southwest Coast Path, um, come with you to Iceland. Um, it's almost like they're sort of characters in a book. They sound great fun. Well, they are. They're an incredible couple that we met when we were walking the coast path. And uh, we stayed in touch with because because they were so just such nice people. And uh, yeah, they came to Iceland with us and they really are a very, a very fun couple. A very, very northern, very big characters and full of life and um yeah they they made our trip to iceland um a, a lot uh, a lot warmer than it should have been <laughs> i can't let you go without asking ray what's next i hope that you are going to write a third book and if so are you, is there anything that you're able to share with us that what that might be uh, yes there will be a third book hopefully it will be next year um and you'll definitely need your walking boots for this one. It's 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 another walk. <laughs> of course it is. Fantastic. Well, we, we will look forward to that. Thank you so much for being here with us uh, today. Um, Ray's books are available at Stanford's online. Do please, if you haven't read The Salt Path, please read it. Read it again if you have. And, and then please pick up The Wild Silence because they are beautifully written and really take you um, 
to places when we when we can't get out just now they are really the next best thing so Ray we wish you well we wish please send our very best wishes to Moth as well um, and look forward to seeing you in person sometime soon uh, and in the meantime go well. I look forward to it thank you Jugo. Wow watching that lad walk away to spend a night in his tent with a bowl of soup such a moving recollection that properly floored me. How much we are all alike is a wonderful thing to hold on to. That memoir, The Wild Silence by Raina Wynne, is available to buy at stanfords.co.uk. And so lovely to hear how Twitter can be a force for good. We'd love to hear your thoughts and questions from throughout the Stanford's Travel Writers Festival and beyond. You can always tweet us at Stanford's Travel.